Okay, so the presentation will be a bit more sparse this time. I'm going to put some questions up. Um, we're also going to take a look at some excerpts from an essay by Stanislav Lem, another science fiction writer and literary critic about Philip K. Dick, and it's kind of about science fiction, science fiction in general. Uh, very rich stuff, so I had to be, <laughs> I had to limit my excerpts from that, but I still wound up taking a lot. Um, okay. We were just talking about him, isn't he the one who wrote Solaris? Yes, Solaris is the one that is probably best known for. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is he? Yes, I, also, I would also like to add that I have just compared. I mean, before the session, uh, I I compared. Uh, the photos of um, uh, Stanislav Lem, Carl Sagan, um, Philip K. Dick, and uh, I don't know which uh, which author. And I realized that they all look like brothers. I don't know. They have the same <laughs> yeah. eyes, you know. Some there, it, there, there is something. Be. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. I, I think there's. They are of a type. I think there's a physiognomy of science fiction writers. <laughs> really? Indeed. Yeah, just compare it. You know, Carl Sagan when he was young and, you know, it, it was so, so funny when I, but they look really normal, you know. Unlike Find pictures of R Robert Anton Wilson also and Ray Bradbury. They all, they all look kind of like that. Yeah. I don't know what oh, it is. So special expression you know and and so good natured eyes it is to see you can yeah. see that you know longing for a better world and uh, you know better universe and yeah they are really amazing yeah absolutely yeah they are definitely of a type that is really bizarre i hadn't really thought about it directly until you said that <laughs> but yeah it's a good observation let's not get out our calipers yet <laughs> <laughs> We can measure their skulls. Ah, yes. Here we have degenerate science fiction writer. Um, but I met Carl Sagan once when I was in college. He came to oh, University wow. of Hawaii to uh, give a speech, and um, he seemed very clean. I would not have guessed that person ever did any drugs, whereas Philip K. Yeah. Dick <laughs> seems like I'm a different. Yeah, yeah definitely, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> Yeah, I that that figures well with how I would imagine Carl Sagan. Um, oh, hang on one sec. I have the wrong thing open. Let's go ahead into the slide presentation. So yeah, the presentation, as I said, will be a bit more sparse here, but we're going to also go into another platform called Comic Rack, <laughs> which is made exclusively for showing sort of like graphic novels and comic books. But I found a copy, I don't know if everybody heard this, but I found a copy of the Robert Crumb, uh, some of his weirdo stuff, like he, he did a bunch of illustrations over the years. He's probably best known for doing illustrations for the Grateful Dead posters and some album covers. <clears throat> um, but he did a whole comic of the mystical experience of Philip K. Dick. And we're going to go through the whole thing. Well, probably not the whole thing. It's a little bit long. We'll see. We'll feel it out. If it gets to feel it, feeling like it's dragging on too much, then we can kind of cut it short. I do want to at least get to the part about his son and, and you know, how all that came about. So uh, to start off, final discussion, welcome everyone. Uh, this quote, that I found to be pretty relevant from the exegesis, I thought would be a good thing to open with. And that exegesis is pretty chaotic. Um, as I was saying before everyone arrived, sometimes it's like the Tractatus by Wittgenstein, where there are like numbered aphorisms, like little proverbs, and they're supposed to build up on each other. So there are like parts of it that are like that. And then there are parts of it that are just, you know, weird little drawings and some seemingly schizophrenic rambling <laughs> for a couple pages. Um, but there's some very good stuff in there. Too much was written about Ubik for me to really get into it because it's crossed over with other works of his. Um, so they're all like interrelated. Uh, so I did pick out some pieces, though. So he says, if there's to be immortality, there must be another kind of time, one in which the past events, in which past events, the past in its entirety can be retrieved, that is, brought back. I did experience such a time. 
therefore, <laughs> immortality is possible. Um, so this, I'd say, applies pretty directly to the way that he imagines the half-life. And there's something about the half-life that we could think about where the half-life is really supposed to be the analogy to the life as we live it, <laughs> in a way. You know, the voices from outside are in a higher, I don't know about higher reality, but uh, let's start off with a couple of questions. So first, we're going to do some straightforward questions. <clears throat> problems with them all being in half-life two of them that i can't quite wrap my head around and i thought i'd ask you guys uh if they're all in half-life why can't jory interact with Runciter? i hadn't really thought about it too much until this week it kind of occurred to me well that's why i didn't think they all were i thought that Runciter wasn't in half-life and so he transported the crew to cold pack and that he was trying to um contact them from the outside just as uh just as mentioned you know that one line that was transposed in your book that said he saw yeah. joe that, you know that's that's what i thought and that's why yeah, but then the, the final twist really throws that all into question, though. I mean, he gets the money with Joe Chip on it, and I mean, that's... Well, I thought either he died later, because there's yeah, yeah, could be. no explanation for the explosion in front of the hotel that knocks right. Joe out, but doesn't affect anyone else. So if Mr. Runciter had a stroke while he was contacting Joe... I could see how that would affect Joe, but no one else. And then all of a sudden, Runciter's in Half-Life, and he's sitting in the hotel room. And just like everybody else who's recently dead, he doesn't quite get that he's recently dead. There's, there seems to be a memory of the other life and a memory like what 1992 is like and a sensation of being in Half-Life. But there doesn't seem to be like anyone in the book who has a memory of actually the moment of dying it's like trying to remember the moment you actually fell asleep you know yeah yeah i've been thinking about the two explosions also they the are other, turning points go ahead sorry the other thing i thought is possible just because it's philip k dick is we had this foreshadowing in the book that people can be reached in the real world while they're asleep because jory reached out and contacted each one of those those special people so at least psychics or inertials can yeah yeah so i wondered if maybe when Runciter um pulls out that money that maybe it's a dream and joe chip has reached the point of strength that jory has so he can reach someone in a dream hmm that's possible yeah yeah i i, I was leaning more towards the delayed the de delayed death idea possibly like you mentioned um maybe the second explosion is yeah him something happening to him it manifests to joe in that way for some reason because nobody else experiences the second explosion aside from from joe and then i thought the last possible explanation is it works like um i don't know if they're ukrainian or if they're russian those nesting dolls like yeah. maybe Rensiter, who shriveled up into a dry husk in Half-Life, is now his story is being picked up at the very end, and he's in a Half-Life somewhere else. <laughs> he's seeing Joe Chip on his money. Like, yeah, just, that also seems like something Philip K. Dick would have fun with. <laughs> yeah. I, or, I think, or, mm, go ahead. I think uh, Rancitor represent uh, as old men uh, some kind of uh, wisdom and uh, uh, and uh, he's immune on the force of uh, jury because yeah. of that. Could be. That could be. Yeah. Yeah, he is constantly touted as the wise old one who's been around since the <laughs> turn of the century or something like that. Um, Plus, so, he yeah. 
to yes. hate jewelry and none of the rest of them came into this world hating jewelry, but Runciter already does because jewelry's messing with Runciter's ability to uh, contact. Right. Excuse me, but isn't it at the beginning that the jury interfered in uh, Ranciter's conversation with Ella? So he actually contacted him. He, uh, oh, that is true. Right. He does act, but yeah. I mean, but I mean, when when Runciter appears uh -huh. in in the Half Life world, Jory can't seem to sense or interact with him. Uh, you know, I mean, although I don't know, it's really weird because there's all that yeah. that a whole other problem with Pat and how he was afraid that pat would see him so i don't know it's uh I when rancitor withered uh, perhaps uh, jory eat uh, him as all others right so the explanation in the book was that perhaps his body in the half life had some bit of energy some of that ergic energy to it and so jory even consumed that um but yeah they there was mention of okay so now there are sort of like two of everybody you have the sort of like half-life version and then the real world version like well, that, he, he postulated a, a real world run sitter and then the run sitter that's in the funeral home in in half-life yes Vasilya. well maybe their uh run sitter was uh, in one moratorium and uh, the crew they were another moratorium that's another so, possibility right Maybe, maybe they are all in Half Life, and Runciter is at some distance because there is mention of you know having them within some physical proximity to each other that causes their interaction. So yeah, that's another possibility. Um, Especially because uh, 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 um, Joe Chip he traveled uh, to I think Des Moines uh, to visit Runciter's body or something like that. Right. Yeah, I wonder if that this wart transported the crew to cold pack. You know, she she never shows up dead. That's true. Or maybe Hollis, <laughs> maybe Hollis was right there waiting for this all to go down, and he's like, "Ha ha! Now I can pop them in my fridge." <laughs> we don't know that they are in cold pack on Earth necessarily. He could be, you know, could be anywhere. Okay. Um, what next? Um, the use of money. So I've been, yes, Vasily? Well, also, Jory mentioned that everything in a half life is made by him and that it's uh, right. like a building there just to see, to watch it. Uh, but also in uh, real life, when they, when the um, film critic presented real life, uh, it seemed like, uh, I don't know, they were like, isolated from uh, other like no one no one else is mentioned except for them like Ranster and his crew and you mean when they're alive well yes also mm -hmm. uh i don't remember like they, they go to the moon and like uh, that's ordinary and yeah hmm. uh yes ajit I think your sound is off. You're muted. 1939 was the baseline, which mm -hmm. they couldn't go back any farther. And I don't see why that seems almost arbitrary, except yeah. for you guys have pointed out that that's the only time that uh, Runciter would be most closely associated with that time. Is it possible that they were all in Runciter's half-life? That's conceivable. Um yeah, I, I actually wish I had looked into that exegesis for 1939. <laughs> maybe I could have found something in there on that. Um, in fact, maybe I'll do a quick check. <clears throat> I do have it in PDF form. Let's see if I can find anything that's... The other thing about searching through this thing, it's huge. It's like more than a thousand pages and Sometimes you'll stumble onto something that's, well, abstruse. <laughs> it is not easy to access in the moment. Um, so 1939, let's see if I get any hit. Oops, that's 1938. Let's see if I get any hits out of this. <clears throat> um, 
maybe that's the year when sorry for interrupting maybe that's the year when Rancite was born or uh, when when his memories began right uh, his, his yeah i think they said he's from earlier than that though uh i can't remember exactly where so we have three hits on 1939 in the exegesis one of them is mm -hmm. in a small uh biographical note about sociologist lucien levy brule who died in 1939 but that doesn't seem to be the case let's see another one is a reference to Astounding Science Fiction, which was published in July 1939. And last, Sigmund Freud died in 1939, huh? Uh, and this this is not his writing, though. This is towards the end. You have some other people contributing their thoughts. Um, so, no, I don't know. Because the way that I have found some explanations by Philip K. Dick in the exegesis, he talks about how uh, it's the way that he sees that Philip sees time uh, is something more like time is a force and in the half-life the force stops being active so it's kind of a little counterintuitive I think <clears throat> and that's why it's not so much that things are regressing it's that kind of you're still moving <laughs> or something like that um, the older versions emerge and it's more like uh, it's more like part of an entropic process. It's that the force of time is required to keep the plate spinning, something like that. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was time of great negative energy before Second World War. Yeah, I, uh, I brought that up that some people think that 1939 is the birth of the modern world because it was just the year of World War II. But I, it also could be in terms of the story, just the year that Half-Life was invented, because it has to be that yeah. that's 53 years before 1992. So it has to be recent enough that Von Vogel song can remember people burying themselves and how barbaric that was. So that kind of makes sense. When we think about things people did 53 years ago, you know, like use a paper roadmap, it's barbaric barrack but it's not unbelievable when we think about things neanderthals did it's like hard for us to relate you know right there's some threshold there that's crossed yeah and it's hard to say what it is um i don't know if i come across anything else about it i'll just email you guys but it's something that i i wish i had remembered to look into um maybe it would regress further if something else happened maybe there's still some kind of ergic energy being contributed to the cold pack world that's stopping it there but they say that's not the case but how should they know i mean they no one seems to be an expert on that that world that they're inhabiting <laughs> um so i was thinking more about the use of money something occurred to me that okay so a couple of basic things so from the beginning of the story money represents sort of just as it does in real life, kind of freedom of movement, <laughs> freedom to do things, to have things, uh, freedoms that don't come easily to Joe Chip um, <laughs> because of his habits. And uh, But in the half-life, money is all over the place. It's either old and useless, and therefore denying them the freedom that they would have just by dint of being from another time, or appears to be counterfeit and shows the face of Runsitter or at the end, Joe Chip. So one thing I was thinking about, maybe, okay, so what else has coinage shown, especially further back in time, like in the old days, uh, specifically in more ancient times? the coin of the realm, right? Showed the face of kind of who is the authority. You know, do you know what I'm getting at here? So like maybe when we're getting the run sitter money. Yes, yes. I have he's... Go ahead. Uh, well, in ancient times, uh, uh, emperors were put on uh, coins. Right. Or ancient Greek. So yeah, that's kind of what I was getting at. 
like maybe the the coin is telling us who's in charge who's turf we're on <laughs> like maybe they're in Runciter's half life somehow i'm trying to think of what maybe it would yeah like uh, joe is in Runciter's kingdom <laughs> right at the end, Joe uh, is uh, on the face because uh, he owns uh, uh, Ubik mm -hmm. and uh, Long Life uh, recipe for Ubik, and he is that person. Right. So, was, go ahead, Ajit. So, the, the coin could be telling us whose world we're in. Right. And the domination runs through for most of the story might be consistent with the 1939 base. Um, and in the end, uh, we, we're switching to Chip's um, world. And one thing that, you know, we know that is not really explicitly discussed, you know, the side, first, we're, we're positing a change in, in emperors and change in worlds. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that's consistent with that is Jory. Jory is able to capture and take control of worlds. So maybe at a greater level, Runciter and Chip can uh, have dominant worlds that we are m m guests in or something. Yeah, the existence of realms seems implied when it is stated that there is a sort of manufactory, <laughs> there is a process through which they can band together against Jory and produce Ubik. So that means Jory cannot be, there must be something like demarcations between them that they would experience as something like, you know, borders or limits to their realm. I'll just say realm. Um, <clears throat> and then they interact in different ways. Uh, Vogelsang gets cut off early in the story as he starts to explain that they experience each other's subjectivities, and that's kind of one of the only things that they that they get. Otherwise, they're just stuck in their own subjectivity forever. Um, that's why he encourages Runciter not to put Ella by herself. You know, we, she needs to have some interaction with the others. Now, we could also determine that Vogelsang is not a good actor he's motivated by the desire to keep these people like like a pack of teenagers to be murdered by the villain in a, in a horror film he has to keep supplying the teenagers <laughs> um and that's kind of his job he gets paid for that so but yeah it seems it seems as though they do experience uh, their their subject their subjectivities intermingle in some way and that constitutes a world that is a little chaotic because, well, I mean, it's crossing over the internal lives of people. Like they don't have an external life. They don't have an objective existence to intermingle in like we do with, that we call the world. Yes, Vasilia? Oh, well, uh, maybe a raster in his own, uh, uh, his half-life is like his uh, realm and mm -hmm. Joe Chip's half-life is his realm. So they got coins of each other, which means they are in possess of Ubik or Yeah. You're saying that they're in the other realm of the other person when they have the like Joe Chip is in Runciter's realm or wait, that's what you said no, the first no, time. No, but a uh, Runciter uh gets the coins of Joe Chip uh which uh you mentioned that uh, they can communicate since they were uh, living uh they had communication between uh, themselves and so uh, Reister gets the Joe Chip's coins uh, as a sign that Joe Chip is uh, in his life, half-life is like that is his realm because he uh, tried Ubik. Uh-huh. You're saying that Runciter tried Ubik? Or I, we know Joe Chip did, but... Yeah, but his hmm. coins uh, uh, are after he tried Ubik. So when he tried Ubik, it is like he became a king or it is like he became the king. Yeah, that could be. Yeah. Um, it could also just be there to drive us insane. <laughs> it's a distinct possibility. But I'm inclined to think that there's more to it than that. Um, oh. My thing about what if there someone on um 
on a Reddit subreddit about Ubik mentioned that they're all in in Runciter's because Runciter was the one closest to the bomb, so it makes sense that he's the one that actually died. And my problem with imagining that the whole book is Runciter's actually dead, and he's imagining Joe Chip and Cold Pack because Runciter is in Half Life. But then so much of the book is from Joe Chip's yeah, perspective. Yeah, I I agree with you on that. I think that's so some blame block because when I have a dream at night and I wake up and in my dream maybe all you guys were in it, mm-hmm. I don't wake up and say, "Well, gee, how did you feel about what you did in my dream last night?" <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> have yeah. any consciousness you know yeah so, yeah no i do yeah. that i do that if something someone really makes me angry in the dream I'm like what was wrong with you last night <laughs> how dare you don't talk to me <laughs> um or <laughs> actually somebody did a bit about that it was really funny it was just like his wife was just disgusted with him wouldn't even look at him all day <laughs> like what did i do He's like you don't even want to know <laughs> um yeah i don't like i i would be very disappointed in that that's the same kind of thing that it it rarely happens in a film where they give you a scene where a particular character is alone for a moment and so you say okay so that must be really happening because they're not going to show you the character doing something alone and then say oh no that was in the imagination of someone you see what i mean yeah it's like not it's not fair you know it's kind of unfair writing so to write the whole thing from most of the whole thing from joe's perspective is would be a very unfair move as far as i'm concerned right uh yeah yes and uh, the end is so they can see you. I was gonna say, and Philip K. Dick is a highly skilled writer, so yeah, I don't think he's gonna be making those kinds of mistakes, even if he is on drugs. Yeah, yeah, or even on. I don't think it it would be a mistake, but I mean to do it on purpose, I think is unfair. Right. Yeah, you know? no. Well, that's what I'm saying. I think that's kind of an unskilled writer trick. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I don't think that's what happened. Uh, but the end is finished with a rhyme sitter. And when Ryan, and when the rhyme sitter says uh this is just the beginning, uh I personally don't understand what's the point. Uh I mean I th- when I read that, I read that as this is the beginning of a kind of eternal struggle that they've now become involved in, you know, this kind of like Manichaean good and evil thing they're gonna be doing for as long as they're in the half-life, they're going to be fighting against the force of evil, which is Jory, or maybe Jory is just a conduit for a more radical evil. <laughs> um, well, and I was thinking about, I'm, I know I'm going back a little bit, but I was just, because I was pondering the, the money issue, I kind of, I think I kind of, when I read it, I interpreted the money issue as that's the person that's, in the office trying to contact you. Yeah, that was my first thought too. I was just been thinking about it some more, but yeah. That like, it just shows up as a weird thing, but you know, it doesn't show up as anything else. I mean, do we ever, no, it does. I'm so, what am I saying? Of course it does. It shows up on match sticks and, or matchbooks and. and matchbooks. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. It does show up in some other, but the face <laughs> that's the thing that gets me. Um, yeah, if the book were to continue, then we might have Runciter. I mean, it's perhaps left for the reader's imagination to mm-hmm. put this all together and consider that Runciter is now going to wonder is he in Half Life and Joe yeah. Chips trying to contact him? Yeah, <clears throat> I also felt like that there are a little parts of the book here and there where I feel like it's maybe poking fun at the whole genre a little bit, the genre of science fiction. You know, it's obviously breaking a bunch of conventions, which is something we're going to get into later when we look at pieces of, pieces of that Stanislav Lem essay, um, where you could imagine a kind of, you know, lowbrow science fiction series with the fights, like, the you know, you've got the kind of A-team <laughs> of Runciter's crew, you know, fighting forever against the villain Jory, 
uh, and it could be serialized like <laughs> any other sort of cheesy science fiction vehicle. Um, there are a couple of other places too where I got a little bit of that impression. Uh, I can't think of them off the top of my head though. Um, I think that uh, Dick wanted uh, on purpose to confuse us with uh, this story to show that uh, nothing is sure in the world. We don't, uh, yeah. we cannot be sure on anything. That would be a very Philip K. Dick thing. <laughs> I would say he wouldn't use the word confuse, but he would be more like, you need to take a momentary look at the way that reality actually is which is chaotic <laughs> they we like cast our order upon it but underneath it's chaotic and layered because here he is saying time doesn't exist that he he thinks it's not just a memory but i actually transported myself back to the past and it's still there in its entirety so this so, is an world view <laughs> he, he elaborates on that it's not that he doesn't think time exists he thinks time exists but it's a force so this is a pretty unique way to characterize time and the whole thing about the half-life world is that the force is absent and so things are just unraveling basically um that's that's what those past versions are the, the, the unraveled unraveled versions of items it's a form of temporal entropy i guess maybe that's even a redundant statement i don't know <laughs> but yeah an unraveling but i still can't quite get my head around unraveling to previous versions versus getting literally physically old and like rusty and dusty uh in any case Sorry, uh, it just reminded me of, uh, mm -hmm. you know, William Faulkner is um, saying the past is never dead. It is not even past, you know. Yeah. Uh, so it's something like that. Which yeah. Which reminds us, I think. Absolutely. I mean, that's, <clears throat> um, I don't know how many of you saw that, at least that final scene from Waking Life where uh, yes. Richard Linklater no, talks about. I haven't seen it, no. I'll send you a link to it. It's on YouTube, mm -hmm. but. Richard Linklater mm -hmm. talks about, I think it's somewhere in the exegesis also. I just didn't have time to read the thousand pages. <laughs> um, where he even kind of revised the idea. First, it was like, actually, yeah, there's no time. Uh, actually, there is time, but it's all only one moment. And that moment is in like 30, 30 AD or something like that. And Because part of his whole mystical experience was a transport he was transported to basically ancient rome and he was a secret christian avoiding the romans and trying not to be you know murdered by them um but then he kind of revised that into actually it's not even 30 ad it's just there's one moment it's not any specific moment um so yeah in that case the past is not dead it's definitely still alive and still pretty much with us playing along the whole time <clears throat> um so these lapses in judgment, uh, we've discussed some instances of those, I guess some of the most notable ones have to do with those, the time spent towards the end with Pat, where she's being a sort of torturer and she's clearly antagonistic and yet, that uh, wasn't sorry. That wasn't her though, because Jory said he ate her by the elevator. So that was actually, um... Jory masquerading as Pat. Oh, Jory. maybe I, I got that confused. I thought that she was oh, okay. Even she still, even if she... even if it's not even if it's not her, the lapses in judgment come from runs uh, come from Joe Chip and from uh, Eddie Edie, whatever. What was the other guy? I forgot his name. Eddie. Don. Don Eddie. Because Don they, they, they yeah. think they think it's Pat is the point and they're like he's like okay i'll leave you here with pat and go do something else yes you know that's yeah. what that's what i mean so that, like there are these lapses in judge he also tells pat about the uh about the police ticket with the writing on it and she he shows it to her they're like that's terrible judgment why why would you do that vasily yes oh nothing uh accident oh accident okay so 
that's that's what I mean. Like there are several places where you get this, and you know, we we talked about maybe it's just this weird dream logic. I was thinking about it more though, and it's kind of like uh, it's kind of like parapraxis, you know, Freudian slip, except <laughs> just you know, you're doing the thing that pushes the the timeline. Okay, maybe that's a bad choice of words, but <laughs> pushes things forward in a sense. Um, so he was he had a compulsion in other words some sort of something from the id something from deep down that caused him to just well, do that he's not a slick guy and it's just one of those yes it's habitual if someone says please you say thank you if someone opens the door you walk in so she asked to see the ticket and he handed it to her and he's he's just not by nature a very slick operator and that, that still was pat when he showed it to her and she yeah. says what's about me what's that going on you know and then we're back to how joe is not so great in relationships with females you know <laughs> his yeah. may or may not be his wife we don't know <laughs> yeah those are those those lapses in judgment do seem to be exclusively related to pat so i guess there's that um, she has some power over him, perhaps after marrying him in some theoretical past. <laughs> just the way she looks, it just seems like she's um, described both by Rens that are in. Joe is very striking looking. She's striking, but they both comment on her. I mean, Joe and Eddie both comment on her <laughs> malicious nature. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's like real kind of kind of praying mantis situation <laughs> it's like i know she's gonna eat my head off but <laughs> i just can't help myself <laughs> um yeah i guess it could be that anybody else all right anybody else have any other questions you want to talk about so we'll move on to some other stuff here if not um Okay, so I took a few pieces here from the exegesis of Philip K. Dick. As I said, that book is a collection of, you know, just random scribblings and writings. It's kind of like a journal. Uh, sometimes it's very, sometimes it's more coherent than other times. <laughs> um, yes, Vasily? Well, when you search for 1939 maybe you should search for hitler or charles lindbergh because uh yeah they were mentioned. i don't i don't think that he was let me just see really quick i get the feeling i'm not going to get any good hits from that let's see okay well let's see we got something here oh no this is a comment from somebody else yeah towards the end nope he doesn't mention hitler his stuff is not political particularly <laughs> it's it's more out there it's more mystical um uh hang on a sec here ta -ta 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 -ta. where was i hmm. so first of all uh for anyone who does not know william burroughs uh he was one of the beat poets, along with people like Allen Ginsberg and Jack Kerouac. Um, all of them pretty famously libertine characters as far as how they lived their lives. William Burroughs was a lifelong heroin addict, for example. Uh, among other things, he went into the Amazon and did all kinds of hallucinogens. He was much more hardcore into that than uh, Philip K. Dick, who was more like a guy who got into prescriptions <laughs> and wound up in that realm. Um, but he did have, he's probably best known for uh, The Naked Lunch, which is one of the few works of his that was made into a film. Pretty wild film. <laughs> if you, can, it's, uh, it's David Cronenberg. Uh, it's something else. Um, but, uh, as it relates to Philip K. Dick, so he had this idea of reality as a control system and language as an extraterrestrial vir virus. So yes, Philip did interact with this idea in the exegesis. Um, Philip K. Dick also experimented with the cut-up method. So the cut-up method 
is don't judge too harshly by the way <laughs> a method of producing works of art particularly for uh william burroughs and brian geisen another guy uh with whom he worked where they would take audio and video recordings and randomly interweave them you know using the idea is to inject chaos and find out whether chaos is actually saying something they did this to some level of success although i guess it's somewhat subjective you can find many of the cut up films on youtube they're they're up there um they also experimented with a lot of other transic uh methods they built this thing called the dream machine which is a kind of hypnotic device um all around bizarre character um yeah, he was involved with an actual school called the Jack Kerouac School of Disembodied Poetry, which still exists. Um, what else? Yeah, he uh, accidentally killed his wife doing a William Tell trick, shooting an apple off of her head. So, yeah, all around uh, crazy kind of figure. So just so we know who he is. Um, also, throughout the exegesis, we get references to K.W., uh, a close friend of Phillips, another author who's still alive. In fact, if you watch any documentaries on Philip K. Dick, there's a good chance you'll see this guy at some point talking about him. He's still alive. Um, Kevin Wayne Jeter. So at some point in the exegesis, he says that uh, Kevin has noticed a resemblance between several things I've described and what Burroughs has written. For example, my conviction that as a race or even a planet, we are sick. That is occluded. So to be occluded is to kind of be, uh, hmm, what's a good word for that? Kind of put off into a separate area with less or no light is really what it should mean. Um, kind of put into a darkened area separated is a simple way of saying it occluded perceptually and that a divine doctor entity is restoring us coincidence coincidence i should say uh burroughs speaks of a virus a word became a neural cell virus infecting us after reading burroughs i dipped into ubic so this is really directly related to ubic this concept um there's i think we mentioned before the idea of learning a language is you know not just learning to communicate but it's being inducted into a whole world if you kind of, like language is not as neutral as we think it is like be like acquiring a language like acquiring it in an effective way like mastering it in some respect means being inducted into a system of values and aesthetic judgments and all kinds of things that are inherent to the language um so this is one way we could think about uh, language as a virus. It ends up perhaps structuring your views of the world. Uh, that's called linguistic determinism, I think. The idea that, that your language <laughs> actually affects the way that you think about things. Uh, yes, Vasilya. I studied in school uh, that from psychology. Oh, okay. So uh, uh, people who lived in uh, in the north, uh, where there are a lot of snow, they had uh, several words for like for um, I oh for know, snow I, for snow. They had several several words for snow, while in some places they have like one or something like that. Right. 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 So I'm thinking more, I think it can be even more. Let me give you an example. Um, I think more deeply, like when you learn an Asian language, like I was just gonna say, yeah. you have so many more words for family members, because that's how that's what's important to us, how we seat ourselves in the world. But there aren't regular tenses in um, Chinese, well, I shouldn't say Chinese, in Mandarin, you know, they, they denote something happened in another time through another, what we would think of more like a noun. 
But the thing about their culture is because of their writing system being pictographic, you can feel connected to your culture and that culture by reading something a thousand years old and maybe the pronunciation is different, but you can reach back to it. Whereas if yeah. I try to read something even 500 years old, we're talking Shakespeare, the word meanings have changed too much for me to realistically understand what they were trying to say, unless I'm a more educated person and I hmm. know what the word meant at the time. I don't know if we would describe Chinese as our Mandarin as not shifting, though, would we? I, I mean, I think all living languages have meaning drift. Um, yeah, but less. There's less because, perhaps. you know, the pictograph for a dog is going to be the pictograph for a dog, whereas in our. Right. Language, but so, like, OK, the thing is that our ontological concept of the dog changes so even if the pictograph stays the same like if you have a pre-scientific view of a dog then you might even have a more you might even have a sort of animistic view of of a dog where you have like more of an idea of the dog's spirit or something like that um and then you know scientific revolutions occur and then you have all these other biological notions that get wrapped up in it and all of those things play a part but some get getting too much into that specific example because it just seems like no this is no this works so this is in lots of languages whatever they focus on like in japanese you can speak a lot of sentences and you don't have pronouns the subject is um at the end by the verb ending and you can't do yeah. that in english you can't just say walking down the street <clears throat> know if you who's walking down the street a dog a baby a person right and so, right that's all it's all like is your perspective me 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 looking out or is your perspective like the world looking in there's languages mm -hmm. where you always have to know what direction you're facing and that's going to change your tense um there it's just it's very oh, much yeah, yeah, yeah. to how you see the world absolutely I, I, there's another good example from Japanese where uh, one of the things that's really hard for a non-native speaker of Japanese to pick up uh, would be some of the aspects of humor that, that are related to the fact that the subject comes at the end and you can do a subject absent statement. So you have to get the implications of this ab absent subject that comes at the end of the sentence. And so there's a good example of a sense of humor developed around a way of communicating, right? So that's mm -hmm. that's a good example of linguistic determinism, I would say, probably better than talking about that. There's this problem of, <clears throat> I can't remember who it was, maybe it was Willard Quine. Uh, no, I can't remember. Uh, this problem of ostentation, like if you meet, if you were to meet some other culture and you had zero language in common, um, so you would kind of start trying to communicate through ostentation where you kind of like point and you say, you know, rabbit. <laughs> and then that's like, the, those are the first steps and you kind of build up from there. But the problem is you're never going to have their ontological understanding of a rabbit. Like you're not, you're never going to be inside their subjectivity or their culture's subjectivity. If you spent enough time, you could get inducted into that language and that culture more and more and have a better idea of it. But, the problem That's is that so many misunderstandings have been created because i remember when i was a little kid i innocently asked this question i was like so okay columbus shows up in america but like he doesn't speak their language they don't speak his language like do we know there was actually this treaty created and portugal owned this and spain owned that and so as i got older and i was studying that more one thing that i learned was when the british people first came to the mainland us their um their opinion of the natives who lived there was that they were the quote laziest people on earth because they spent all day hunting and nobody but an aristocrat back home would have had time <laughs> to like, go off on a hunt and so their derision for the local people was actually based on much more than just the color of their skin is different right. it was based on like everything about their culture is wrong 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 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, clearly we have a lot more going on for us. I mean, I've fed my anxiety for seven hours today already, and it's not even noon. <laughs> yeah. I forget where I heard this other thing. It's that maybe it was a comic. An angel talks to God and says, you took a perfectly good ape and gave it anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> um so and there's... according to Bible, it was first uh, the word, uh, yeah. word. So language is older than material things. Right. So the thing is, like, the, in sort of Gnostic or other kinds of interpretations of what that means is this thing that's the logos, which is all over Valis, right? It's the living information. Word is kind of the best thing we can come up to dis with to describe it, but yeah, the universe is information, uh, is how Philip K. Dick would put it. The universe is information that is also alive. Um, so language okay. is transmits information. Yes, Vasile? Uh, well, maybe uh, Philip K. Dick and uh, Borrow, uh, uh, they may be searched uh, since in uh, ancient Greek mythology the world uh was made from chaos May, uh, that's why uh philip uh, uh, uh wrote like this chaotic book uh, so simply maybe he was experimenting yeah uh, yeah trying to uh, uh um, to prove or could uh, something uh be made from chaos and something like that. No, absolutely. I mean, <clears throat> Philip K. Dick was also one of these guys who likes to throw the, to cast the E King, you know, the numerology system. So he was doing divinations and stuff like this. If you guys aren't familiar, it's a Chinese numerology system used to, it's kind of like, I don't want to say it's like tarot cards. That's not quite accurate, but it is used as a f form of, reading possible future events um through a numerological system he writes about some of his e-king experiences in the exegesis so he's definitely cool with and wants to inject supposed chaos into the also that's the point of the cut up method that we were talking about before the cut up method of doing media is trying to insert randomness and seeing what's coming through in that randomness um he, go, he also says the virus of Burroughs is an information or word virus, but in this sense, it blocks reception of information. So it's anti-information virus, and then it substitutes false information, die messages inside your psyche. Now, I'm not sure if this is shorthand for die as in dice, like random or if it's die as in die. <laughs> uh, the singular of dice, guys, if you didn't know, is die. Dice as in, you know, Kotzke, mm -hmm. is that right? Yes, uh, I think you are right. He thinks, uh, he. I think uh, he uh, was speaking about dice. Yeah, yeah I, I thought so too. Die messages mm -hmm. is a bit strange. <clears throat> I thought he meant like a mold. Isn't the meaning of die as a mold? Let me look that. Uh, maybe see. maybe he thought that uh, die, I think that's DYE. He, Go ahead. That, uh, well, when he said die messages, that dice is equally bad uh, as to be dead. E equally be. wrong. Equally bad. Bad. Yeah. Right. Machinery, the second version, the second meaning of die in my dictionary and machinery, any of various devices for cutting or forming material in a press or stamping or forging machine. That's mm -hmm. I immediately read that. As... Okay, that actually works pretty well, I think, for this context, right? Kind of, uh, yeah, prefabricated <laughs> in a sense. Because some mm -hmm. of this is all... Some of this is a little bit like I'll accept it as interesting, but I'm not sure I still believe it. It seems a little bit old fashioned belief to me. I know you all read The Crying of Lot 49. Mm -hmm. Ajit and I had coincidentally read that book around the same time as a family uh, book club thing. So while I was reading that book, remember they all went to a club and they're listening to this modern music 
that's made out of stripping down sounds to like the most bottom vibration and then building it back up again. So I went to YouTube. Yeah, that's Actually, a real that's a real band. Yeah, yeah. I listened to some of this quote unquote music and it was horrible. It just sounded like <laughs> noise, just like the people are just, I mean, this was a for real thing. They were absolutely serious about like maybe this would be more natural music. Maybe this would That's I see that's not what motivates it. noise. I, I actually listen to a lot of noise. <laughs> I know. I, I'm sorry. Um, and I'm not the biggest fan of them. I forget their name. But... I'm not a big fan at all of it, but I'm just saying Philip K. Dick and Burroughs and all these people are seated in this world where that's what's going on at the time. Everybody's like trying to get to the bottom of things and everybody's trying to find the universal vibration. And I can buy it as a historical kind of like those charming 60s. They did some hilarious stuff. But I don't really believe it as a like modern day, it's 2020, like, I, I don't know that I think language is a virus anymore. That, that's all I'm saying for myself. Sure. I, I, I'm not saying that we should believe or dis disbelieve it. I think it's a, a kind of lens. It's a lens through which we can. I mean, life is gathering of lenses, right? <laughs> this is just another lens you can look through. This is like a way you yeah. can look at things. That's a good way to see it, I think. Yes, Vasily. But the language can be used as a virus. Uh, so um, maybe they thought uh, on that. And also, um, it is uh, maybe he questioned uh, himself, uh, how we got uh, some ideas, or because he's talking about that something substitutes uh, false, substitutes the genuine information. So maybe he thought uh, how. Uh, how are uh, it is in Serbian? Uh, I did that in lit. It is like Tolstoy in uh, Anna Karenina. Mm -hmm. uh, it is mentioned that it is a uh, lit, um, it is uh, like uh, something that they do, like uh, those who write books. Um, mm -hmm. They are uh, writing about inner world or inner, inner thoughts of the hero. Mm -hmm. So maybe he was questioning uh, himself how our uh, opinions, uh, why do we think uh, that uh, right. There was yeah. a thing that Robert and Ten Wilson, we used to say, he would say convictions create convicts um, in, in the terms of having an opinion or a belief kind of ties you to a certain way of seeing things. Um, now, for most people, that would sound like okay you need to then get rid of all your beliefs and that is something like what robert and tom wilson would say you need to kind of dig dig them out it's not that you'll never have beliefs you won't be able to function but you need to kind of crack through all these other ones and i guess here the vehicle would be would be language this induction right there's actually a a much longer explanation in the exegesis that has to do, and I don't totally understand it yet because I didn't have time to read all of it. <clears throat> um, the mind winds up kind of the angel of salvation following this absence he describes as a magnet, um, perhaps chasing it. So the virus of Burroughs is entirely negative, and it can be negative even for Philip K. Dick um, in the sense that it can do this thing where it blocks reception of the information that you need to cure yourself. So you can be in a state of desperation and sort of an automaton based on patterns that you develop through language. Um, but you also need the that organizing principle. You need the language, the living information. There's a good aspect to it too. Uh, that actually is coming up next. Um, uh oh wait i thought i had one more thing oh yeah yeah it will come up again um so some of the stuff he said on ubic itself so this is part that is kind of like tractatus it goes on for much longer than this but i just kind of took the beginning <clears throat> the brain is an organizing principle okay it constantly assembles and it just distributes visual and audible messages uh these messages are the prime instrument of its organizing we're only subliminally aware of the messages. That is to say, they are latent. So they're sort of inactive in a way. Through the messages, uh, the brain coordinates us sentiently. 
draws us into itself, frees us from blind determinism. So you see, he has also, he's not saying that language is entirely bad. Um, in the way that Veros saw it as almost a malevolent alien force, literally from outer space, he says, frees us from determinism. This is an interesting take. Uh, we're subsumed by it, it's sentient. Therefore, we are guided by sentience, not cause and effect or chance. So that's like this old problem of free will versus, so these days it is pretty much not believed to be in a scientific sense, a real thing, free will. The universe is deterministic entirely, all the way down to the electrical impulses in your brain. So there is no such thing as free will. There are, is an in-between kind of belief in something called compatibilism that says you have free will, but the universe is also determined completely. Um, you can not, okay, you can change what, you can change your will. You can do what you will, but you can't change what you will. You can't change what you want, in other words. Something like that, if that makes sense. Um, anyway, but he takes another road and says that sentience is a way out. Oh yeah, the other possibility is randomness. So either you're completely determined or if you get down to like quantum physics and there's just randomness and quarks going off in random directions, which is the better picture? Either you're completely determined or you're your free will is actually just random shots <laughs> going off in different directions. Uh, and that appears to be free will. So he comes up with another thing. It's your sentience is actually the way between those. Um, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre does a similar thing where he says, you're, you're actually, your mind is a kind of nothing. <laughs> That's why it's not affected by the causal world entirely. Of course it's influenced, but you do have free will, but that's because the mind is a kind of absence. Um, a void almost. Um, we're totally unaware on a conscious level of all of this, going back to five, for example, five. But this explains why I wrote what's in Ubik. I was describing the brain's messages. So this is an interesting way of looking at the book. It's all, you know, in a mind. <laughs> the brain's messages and what is more discerning behind them, the brain, which I called Ubik. Seven, Ubik is true. <laughs> um, it goes on for much longer than this, but I thought it was pretty interesting. That's what I thought was interesting, that if, um, if, if well, some people were saying Ubik is God, mm -hmm. and if I believed that God was like a sentient entity, not myself somewhere up in the sky, that's a little disappointing. That's kind of like, okay, it was all a dream. But if God is just a collective consciousness of people, what I liked about that is that explains how God, quote, makes mistakes, you know, <laughs> I mean, how God is like jealous in the Bible, how he's vengeful. Well, if it's just us, if it's just a collection of us, yeah, sure. We all do terrible things. <laughs> um, who I'm trying to think of uh, Spinoza. Um, I think he might take more of a Spinoza idea of God. So Spinoza was pan pantheist, basically, that basically everything is God. So <laughs> that would include what you just said. There is literally nothing that exists that is not God. Um, I'm not sure if he would characterize God as a personified thing, except in Christ. <laughs> but I'm not sure, to be honest. Spinoza Jewish? Yes, but he was excommunicated, uh, if that's the right word, <laughs> for the temple, uh, for the synagogue. Uh, yes, Spinoza was Jewish, but he had a view that Christ was, was, God. was in... No, 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 not Christ. No, 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 I was talking about Philip K. Dick oh, when I said that. Uh, yeah, that part it was about Philip K. Dick. Uh, Spinoza had a view that was interpreted as basically atheism. The pantheist view was interpreted by the church elders at the time as as atheism that's why he was excommunicated literally that what that excommunication was re, was uh appealed like two years ago and they held it up they're like nope <laughs> even after all this time he's still not welcome they wanted to like posthumously 
re yeah, well the problem with that kind of thinking is like have you ever taken your little girl you know to to school and the teacher's telling everyone is special but when you say everyone is special that's the same thing as saying no one is special so see i have a good I'm argument against that <laughs> okay. i have a, I have, a, I have a very good argument against i hear that all the time so imagine if you will three shapes circle square uh triangle and you say hey they're all different they're all unique and then somebody says oh that means they're all the same yeah, but different and unique mean something different than special special right but i mean that's maybe another way to say it i mean I everyone's would, different I, everyone's if i was a teacher i'd say it, all, all three of those shapes are unique in that case I mean, yeah, I, just I, would use sure, I would make sure the children know everyone's unique. I wouldn't do that blather about them all being special. <laughs> yeah, yeah they special, I guess. Yeah. They are unique. <laughs> special is too squishy a word. <laughs> yeah. Uh, someone's bound to, someone at some point is bound to say, do you mean I'm God or something? <laughs> if I were to take these three shapes and say they're all different, you know, the answer is not to say they're all the same, but the pushback is to say, so what? They're each different, but so what? <laughs> yeah, I know. It's just that I hear so when I, I hear that that thing. It's you're right. It's better aimed at the everyone is different. If everyone's different, then no one's different. No, that doesn't make sense if you think about it. <laughs> um, okay. Here's something else that he wrote about Ubik. Christ speaks of the tiny mustard seed. Uh, and the gloss on, I think he means the, I don't know, the Judaic Bible. So well, like the Talmud or I'm not sure. Stresses that the kingdom will enter inconspicuously, very small, that is lowly, where would be, where we would be least likely to look for it. Uh, the stone rejected by the builder. This realization is very important. And this lowly trash, this is going to segue nicely into that Stanislav essay, uh, that Lem essay. This lowly trash, bottom penetration, is exactly how I portrayed Ubik, the substance, in the story Ubik. On match folders, in tawdry commercials, therein lie the divine messages. So, yeah, the vehicle for the divine revelation is in the cheap commercial products and things like this, media images. Yes, Vasilya? Uh, he, as I understand, he wants to say, and when he says Ubik is truth, it's like in Bible when Jesus says, uh, I'm the truth. So, mm. uh, and uh, he wants here to say, to say that uh, we may not see, uh, we uh, may not see the God. We don't know how he, what's his, right? Uh, um as a person not how he looks but we can see it is uh like uh, what is good to do or when someone uh, says to us something or uh, uh somewhere or like when we somewhere go or um, anywhere uh we can see uh like his message i think he wants to say that yeah especially if you look in the unexpected places uh, is I think what he's getting at there. When used properly as directed. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think the J is the James King James Bible, just because everything Maybe. About is in the new Testament, not really in the old, he's talking about like Jesus when he shows up. Yeah. Yeah. It would, it, well, you're right. It would not be. <laughs> Well, no, this, I have, to, yeah, you're, I think you're right, it's actually, because the Talmud yeah. would not contain Jesus. What am I thinking? <laughs> well, that's, that's the Old Testament. Yeah. Um, no, you're right. You're right. That's, I feel silly now. Okay. Um, so we have, okay, let's look at some parts of this Stanislav Lem essay. This is very wordy, and I had to carefully select some pieces, and I'll probably simplify some of the statements. Very thick. Uh, First of all, Stanislav Lem, uh, a moment about him, Polish writer, science fiction and essays. He did literary criticism, which is what we're about to take a look at. Mostly this essay focuses on what well, starts off with the general state of science fiction uh, as a kind of perhaps trashy category <laughs> of writing um, and how uh, Philip K. Dick did something different. 
Um, and yeah, as we said, he's probably best known for Solaris. Um, in any case, let's take a couple bites. Uh, so he says, uh, basically from the warehouse of tropes <laughs> of science fiction, telepaths, cosmic wars, parallel worlds, time travel, uh, Philip K. Dick takes these devices. Uh, in his stories, terrible catastrophes happen. But this too is no exception to the rule. We find that all the time in SF. You know, you've got worlds ending and zombie apocalypses and so on. <clears throat> um, for lengthening the list of sophisticated ways in which the world can end is among the standard, let's just say the MO of SF. <laughs> uh, but where other writers explicitly name and delimit the source of the disaster, whether social, so some terrestrial or cosmic war, or some natural forces, the world of Dick's stories uh, suffers dire changes for reasons which remain unascertainable. So we don't actually know <laughs> what ends the world <laughs> is kind of what he's saying. And it's uh, it's a push against the genre, which in most cases, not all the demystifications would be complete. Uh, the use of the science fiction techno jargon techno babble is there to you know provide a gloss a sheen of scientific underpinnings uh that totally makes sense but it doesn't happen in philip k dick he, he pushes against that and he leaves this space for uh an area that cannot be penetrated by science i guess that so there is a, a mystical space in the work it's the same thing we were talking about with regard to oh yeah they know about the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Also, they teach you that doctors teach you the Tibetan Book of the Dead. It says, "Do you remember when that doctor taught us about the red light?" So that's like a scientific fact, like anything else. You know, like the the existence of that death process is like the existence of a chair or of a dog. It's just another thing. Um, but there's still this space we don't get to see all the way to the bottom. Uh, so yeah, people perish not because Nova or a war, a Nova or a war has erupted, not because of flood, famine, plague, drought, sterility, not because Martians. Rather, there's some inscrutable factor at work which is visible in its manifestations, but not at its source. And the world behaves as if it's fallen prey to a malignant cancer. Um, he goes on about, th this is skipping ahead a bit, and it's about the sort of so a non sequitur, for those who don't know, is a, something that doesn't seem to logically follow. It literally means that it's out of sequence, non sequitur. So kind of random, random seeming event uh, or string of events, I should say, because the whole point of it being non sequitur is it doesn't follow from what came before. So indeed, his works team with non sequiturs uh, and any sufficiently sensitive reader can without difficulty make up lists of incidents which flout logic and experience alike. But to repeat what was already said in other ways, what is inconsistency in literature? So this is that thing. It came definitely came up in Crying of Lot 49, where you had, uh, I forget his name, the character who recalls his time filming a movie, uh, but he seems to get confused as to whether the events in the film actually happened to him or were just in the movie. So yeah. there's this inconsistency where he's like, ah, yes, the blood on that beach a little stretched out for miles into the ocean. But he's talking about filming a movie. <laughs> yeah. So what is that inconsistency? It's a symptom either of incompetence, which is clearly not the case here, or else a repudiation of some values for the sake of other values. Yes, this is a good way of putting it. That line really struck me. So yeah, the credibility of incidents or their logical coherence those are being sacrificed for the sake of something else more important to Philip K. Dick. Uh, I think in the history of science fiction, when it first started, it was just thinly veiled horror, you know, like H.G. Wells and those guys. But in Dick's lifetime, as people started actual space programs and going to the moon, science mm -hmm. fiction became this great vehicle for philosophical writings where you could yeah. frame in a story, but you could really like the original series of Star Trek, you could really ask yourself sociological questions and philosophical Absolutely. questions. 
and and now it's like it's its own thing there's just some people who who put it down because they don't you know they have yeah it. <laughs> there's all different kinds you know of science fiction um there's stuff that's more just like a space opera you know just an action film that happens to use lasers and teleporters <laughs> um and that's one thing uh but yes it's kind of like what if you were what if you got what you wanted <laughs> in most cases uh well not in most cases in many cases that's kind of what's going on in science fiction but let's use a vehicle other than a genie or <laughs> something like that gives you what you wanted um yeah yeah and yeah, there's the, uh, you know, Frankenstein, Mary Shelley, uh, is not by everyone, but by many people considered to be the first real kind of science fiction, science fiction work that delves into the problem, because it's really explicitly tied to technology yeah. that that reaches in and pulls out a new, like a soul. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, you can think of it. I used to love the... Um, uh, Jules Verne stories. I lived in Iceland for a few years because my dad was stationed there. And in Journey to the Center of the Earth, their journey begins in the mouth of the volcano in, in Iceland. I was convinced I could get to that volcano and get to the center of the earth. I was like, that's right here. Let's drive out there and go see. <laughs> I should find a big door here somewhere. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, so he goes on, the convention proper to a concrete genre becomes fixed with the passage of time. This is something we talked a little bit about before, about how the aesthetic gets fixed, but that was more for the visual aspect. I think the aesthetic of science fiction gets fixed just through repetition. And then what works also when it's fueled by kind of, you know, market sensibilities. Oh, this is what people like to see. Um, consequently, everybody knows <laughs> that in a realistic novel, the author cannot cause his hero to walk through closed doors, but on the other hand can reveal the contents of a dream the hero has had and forgets before he wakes up, even though one th both things are equally impossible. So it's a good way of stating the point. You can have omniscient narration, which is, of course, a complete fantasy. It doesn't exist. But there are rules that you follow that cause you to say, OK, this is a realistic novel or not. <clears throat> the convention of the detective story requires that the perpetrator of the crime be find out, found out. That's generally true. Uh, while the conventions of science fiction, the convention of science fiction requires rational accounting for events that are quite improbable or even at odds with logic and experience. On the other hand, the evolution of literary genres is based on violation of storytelling conventions which have already become static. So in other words, if you don't push against those boundaries, the genres don't evolve. They become like dead genres. And each story is just a playing out of the another story that was already written. And that's true in a lot of cases. I mean, when you see, you know, certain certain stuff that's written in the in the vein of like murder mystery, it how different can it really be? All the big twists have been done at this point. <laughs> it's almost impossible to to get something new. And if you did, it would just be kind of a gimmick, I think, you know, where you'd be interested for a few minutes. Like, wow, that was pretty interesting. It wouldn't make an impact. And it wouldn't turn out that 100 years later, it would be suddenly recognized as a massive sort of genius move. Um, it's been customary to identify the downfall of civilization falsely and narrowly with regression to some past stage of history. So imagine, if you will, like I said, zombie apocalypse. It is kind of, the you know, going back to a primitive state, you know, tribal. Uh, this seems to be a fantasy that people are really into. They, it's, it's portrayed as horror, but it's a secret desire of people. <laughs> uh, there's a part of them that says, God, I wish I didn't have to like pay bills and stuff. I would just go back to you know, living in tribes and, and do it, even if it was in a zombie environment, I'd get used to it. <laughs> Such an, uh, sorry. Da, 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 da. Yeah, even to the cavemen or downright animal stage, such an evasion is often employed in science fiction, since inadequacy of imagination takes refuge in oversimplified pessimism. Mm -hmm. uh, then we're shown the remotest future as a lingering state of feudal, tribal, or slaveholding society, inasmuch as atomic war or invasion from the stars is supposed to have hurled humanity backwards. 
So yeah, that's what happens in those stories. There's a nuclear war, and then everybody's in the sort of primitive state. Yes, Vasilya? And uh, Einstein was asked uh, what uh, weapons will be used in the next war. He replied, uh, I don't know, but uh, after that, uh, there will be uh, a war with, um, like in prehistoric uh, times. With, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, what after, after that one will it'll be with sticks <laughs> or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh such expedients are foreign to Dick. For him, the development of civilization continues, but is as it were crushed by itself, becoming monstrous at the heights of its achievement, which as a prognostic viewpoint is more original than the assuredly unilluminating thesis that if tech tech civilization breaks down, people will be forced to get along by returning to primitive tools, even bludgeons and flints. So yeah, he's saying Phil pushes against those boundaries. Situations and concepts can be understood only through relating them to ones already known. Ah, uh, yeah. This is that, it's like a permanent problem for science fiction. And it, it's related to that thing we were talking about earlier, where, you know, even the ontological picture of a thing shifts over time. Like, yeah, we have all this biological information about trees and dogs now um, and that affects our view that affects this kind of background program that's running in our brain um, but who knows what that ontology will shift to in 200 years it's just like be like impossible to communicate uh, one more thing Vasya, before I get to you have you heard the thing about uh, Wittgenstein I keep bringing him up but he said uh, something like if a lion could speak English, we still wouldn't understand him. And that's what this is about. Because, like, you would not get his ontology at all. It's just, you know, it's just, it would be a completely different, it's a different world is the point. Um, yes, Vasilya? Well, I think um, in science fiction uh, books and in this uh, book also, uh, but also I watched uh, some science fiction movies. Mm -hmm. And but I think they are based on uh, Philip K. Dick or based on writers. Uh, but um, it's like uh, they are. Um, uh, you mentioned that they are, uh, that science fiction is like some uh, uh, um, room uh, for um, philosophy. So like they are arguing. It can be. Can be. Can be. Yes. So they are arguing uh, at some point uh, about the problems in society. Right. Uh, well, that's, uh, I watched actually, I don't know how uh, is the name of the actor, but it's a famous movie, I think, about some uh, robots that like controls and kills and like something like that. It's the actor that was in Terminator. Or, what, Arno actor. Arnold Schwarzenegger? No, uh, no, no, not Terminator, but... Are you talking about Bruce Willis? No, 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 not... There's about... another movie where he's there, he's in there and they control some kind of robots. Nobody goes into the real world or something like that. I can't remember. It wasn't uh, very good. No, it is like with... I forgot also the name of the film. Uh, some uh, cars, robots who are talking. What, Transformers? Yeah, uh, yes, yes. Oh my God, no. <laughs> yeah, <that laughs> no. Actor, <laughs> I watched some of his movie and like uh, some robot, uh, some other movie, or it's like no, some other. So that robot, he is the, like the main, and like uh, he wants to control everything. Uh, he wants to be the chief one. Yeah, I guess I don't know that those. I have a real hard time with stuff like that. I mean, it's junk food. I mean, it sometimes a bag of potato chips is fine, but that's like. I feel like the Transformers is. <laughs> I haven't actually watched it, so maybe I should. I don't know. It's just not really my bag. Uh, it, all that stuff is more about making a product for consumption. I mean, marketing has marketing is always the enemy of any real art <laughs> being produced. Uh, it's yeah, anything that's really risky or pushes the boundaries would probably not get picked up by a big studio. On the other hand, it's cheaper now than it's ever been to make a film. You can get, you know, there are, are very good film editing uh, software that you can get, you know, on your home computer and 
the equipment gets cheaper all the time and it's yeah i mean it's easier and easier and cheaper and cheaper to make a film of course it still takes talent just one second let me uh-huh oh eris is coming over here oh hi hi oh yay okay she's just visiting us for a moment she's got a little hat on for hi, whatever Aris. reason oh, say hi hi <laughs> Look, see, there's you right there. <laughs> there's a nice smile. She loves seeing herself on the camera. She's a big fan. Um, but yeah, <laughs> I'm going to hold on to this baby here while my wife, wife runs out. Um, so yeah, those things are products that are made for consumption. And it's not that they're never any good. You just have to kind of take them. They, they get dumbed down. Do you know, for example, about uh, I Am Legend, how that story from the movie is not at all what happens in the book? Do you guys know the movie, first of all? No. It's a kind of post-apocalypse. It's got Will Smith. Okay, whatever. It's fine. <laughs> um, and there are kind of like feral semi-humans that populate the cities, and he's the only regular human left. Um and he's out there, you know, killing him all the time, supposedly defending himself. But the thing is, the twist in the book that is so important to the story is completely left out of the movie. And that is that he's the monster. He's the one killing everybody. <laughs> so if he can't, if he's the only one left, he can't reproduce. So why is he running around killing everyone? <laughs> Well, it's also presented in the film as these things are kind of just beasts and, you know, but the, the whole point is that they're actually people, they have a society and he's legend because he's the, he's actually the bad guy and you find out at the end that he's the bad guy. That's the big twist. They completely left that out. They just turned it into like this Hollywood movie um, with no, nothing special about it. It's a completely mediocre piece of work. Um, and uh, so that's kind of what I'm getting at. Now, I'm not sure that they could dumb down the Transformers anymore. It's just like a toy. It's a toy that was made into a movie. But anyway, I don't want to go off on that anymore. Seems like the golden age of science fiction is a little bit waning. That um, science fiction is on its way back to being thinly veiled horror. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know. I got one more thing before I get to you, Vasily. Uh, I'm so disappointed in William Shatner. Recently, he's like, when did Star Trek become woke? I'm like, what are you talking about? Because <laughs> he has turned, he has, he has gotten to the point where he's, <laughs> he's been subsumed by the, like the discourse these days. And so in his mind, you know, yeah, Star Trek. What's the difference between you? You're both half black and half white. He's like, but I'm black on the right half. <laughs> you had you delivered that line william shatner <laughs> right right no it's just wild to me because like yeah for those who don't know about star trek star trek was a, like it had the first interracial kiss on television that's what like, i was about to say and he was the one who did it and, and he's he the one who did it exactly he's totally fine with it he thought that was great you yeah. know it's just he's he's gotten really he's gotten really reactionary in his in his old age. Um, I think we're back to the words of meaning. Sh the meanings of words shift, and now woke has become like it's bad. Even though I mean, is it? You know what right? I mean? Yeah. Once upon a time, to be awake was a good thing. <laughs> yeah, wake up! Wake up! <laughs> uh, what did you want to say, Vasily? Sorry. I didn't mean on uh, I didn't mean on uh, Transformers. I just meant on the actor that was oh ah, okay okay Spain, and he was in some other movie and in that movie there was uh, like some uh, it was also science fiction but it was like some technology that wants to rule and uh, wants to replace it's not to replace the human but uh, who wants to rule over the human right and that. yeah yeah okay. Uh, yeah, okay. But uh, that uh, machine controls everything. It has cameras and like so on. It's like. Mm. Uh... That could have yeah. been a lot of movies, though. That could have been. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm racking my brain here. We have to be more specific. Ad Astra. There's a lot of movies that kind of work on that. Yeah. 
And it is also similar to one uh, Philip K. Dick uh, book. Actually, it is not the book. Uh, I watched the movie, Matt Damon, and uh, it is the, I think, you know, I, I forgot the name, all right, but uh, in that book, it is everything is controlled, and like the, uh, it, it is, uh, Matt Damon is the main character in that. Uh, is it a time travel movie at all? Uh, no, it isn't a uh, time travel, but I will find it right now. Hmm. But yeah, I mean, <clears throat> and there are even some kinds of, so for example, epic stories that are not heavily philosophical per se, that are still good, you know, like Dune, for example, it's not, that's more of a, it's almost political, you know, than it is, phil it's more political than it's philosophical. It's about the passage of many, many years, generations go by. I mean, people are familiar with the, the main story, the rise of Paul Atreides, but like the story goes on and he turns into the bad guy pretty much. <laughs> he becomes a sort of fascist dictator. They don't tell you that part. <laughs> um, and that- they move towards saying speculative fiction instead of science fiction. Because when you get to something yeah, like, yeah. it's like, is it fantasy? or is because they're on another world, they're doing all these things, or isn't science fiction because there's hardcore like spaceships and travel and right. like that. Anyway. Yeah, so. yeah. And the same thing for uh, recently, uh, the series, The Expanse, turns out was very well done. I enjoyed that. It's not philosophical. It is more like a political story with uh, humans have spread out through the solar system. So you have like people who move to Mars and then they immediately start having conflict with the earth people. So they split into different societies. And then you have a kind of underclass of people who are out there at the asteroid belt mining. And they're kind of like, so there's a whole class system. Those belters live out there and they're they're kind of an underclass, they're poor. And it turns into a story about how they want to have equal an equal voice in the solar system. So it's a political story. It just happens to take place in space with high technology, but the writing is good and the actors are good. So it, that's, you, you see, it's not speculative fiction. It kind of is like, imagine if we populated multiple planets, how we would wind up fighting each other on that basis in the future. Um, but it's not like this, you know, it's a, it's a different, it's a different beast for sure. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, there's all different kinds. Uh, and a lot of this stuff, this early science fiction in like the 1950s and 60s was really fed by the sort of pulp industry of uh, like SF magazines and paperback publications where you would, you know, there were a lot of trashy, bad stories written. Um, Weird Tales is probably the best known one. Um, those are, of course, huge collector's items now. Um, and Philip K. Dick, he published in those. Some of his early stories were published in Weird Tales and some of those other magazines. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> um, so, yeah, this thing about... Excuse me, let me just take a drink of water. If too much time <clears throat> goes between people living in different areas, they lose the basis to understand common life experiences. Um which we unreflectingly and automatically imagine to be solid or you know, unchanging. It follows that an author who truly succeeds in delineating an image of the far future would not achieve literary success since he would assuredly not be understood. So there's that lion speaking English. <laughs> <clears throat> Consequently, so this is continued from the same paragraph or from the previous paragraph, in Dick's stories, a truth value can be ascribed only to their generalized basis. So we need to like meta picture, which can be summed up more or less as follows. When people become ants in the labyrinths of the technosphere, which they have built, the idea of the return to nature becomes the fantasy, <laughs> becomes utopian, but cannot even be meaningfully articulated anymore because no such thing as a nature that has not been artificially transformed in some way has existed for ages. Today, we still talk of return to nature because we are relics of it only slightly modified in biological respect within civilization. But try imagine, try imagining the slogan return to nature uttered by a robot. <laughs> I love that image. <laughs> uh, what would it mean? It would mean turning into deposits of iron ore or Philip K. Dick would have it turn into the 
previous version, I guess. <laughs> the writings of Philip have deserved at least a better fate than that to which they were destined by their birthplace. That is to say, he's kind of poking fun at the um, American kind of trashy science fiction. If they are neither uniform quality or fully realized, uh, still, it's only by brute force that they can be jammed into that pulp of materials, destitute of intellectual value and original structure. He talks a little bit about how people are just writing the kind of same science fiction story over and over again with different characters um, in, in that pulp uh, publishing world. Uh, its fans are attracted by the worst in Dick, a typical dash of American SF, <clears throat> reaching to the stars and the headlong pace of action moving from one surprise to the next but they hold it against him that instead of unraveling puzzles he leaves the reader at the end on the battlefield <laughs> it's a very good description enveloped in the aura of a mystery as grotesque as it is strange um so that's it for for lem for now there was much more there it was very good just too much to discuss there is a a, a side story about Philip K. Dick being made into an android. And there's even a twist in that story. So some roboticists made a Philip K. Dick android. You can find videos of it on YouTube. An interviewer interviews the android and the android says funny things like, oh, of course I won't put you in the human zoo, ha ha ha. Uh, it's all pretty unconvincing as far as I'm concerned, not just because of its appearance, but because I mean, machine learning, this was like in 2010 or 12, and like AIs now are not even perfected at any, anywhere close to it. Um, back then it was particularly bad and they just were trying to make it sound funny and convincing. Um, so they, they built a functional AI endowed PKD Android, talks and moves, not the most convincing one. And the great twist is that <laughs> somebody stole or Actually, it was lost at the airport, but possibly stolen the head of the android. So it's really like something out of a Philip K. Dick novel <laughs> that the head got stolen. It later had to be rebuilt for $50,000. Um, okay, that's it. Let's actually take a look at the, uh, the mystical experience as related to us by... Robert Crumb. Oh. Uh huh. Oh, the Adjustment Bureau. That's right. That is Philip K. Dick. That also reminds me of uh, Dark City. Did you ever see Dark City? <laughs> I'm Daddy, not Mama. <laughs> um, okay, let's see here. I'm going to share this. Where is it? Aha, here we go. So you might recognize the style. Uh, Robert Crumb, also an incredible weirdo in his own right. Robert Crumb, there's a documentary about him. It's just called Crumb. Watch that if you get a chance. It's wild. The man's a bit of a pervert um, who is lucky enough to have a drawing talent that was his the thing that probably saved him from becoming a complete wreck. Um, so you've seen the first few frames of this from my first presentation. So this is about his epiphany uh so yeah we find here he died in 1982 in march in march of 74 though he saw what he described as a vision of the apocalypse and spent the rest of his life trying to understand what happened so we start off uh in california march 74 he had a wisdom tooth extracted they gave him sodium pentothal by the way that's supposed to be the truth serum <laughs> Sodium pentothal. I didn't know that they gave you that. I guess back then they gave you sodium pentothal for tooth pain. So that was his drug, the part of the drug experience here. So he came home, he was in great pain. By the way, this is transcribed from an interview with him. Oh, I see that, sweetie. Uh, they hadn't given him any pain medication. Wife called the pharmacy and the medications were delivered by this girl. And she was wearing this golden fish. You guys are probably familiar with that Christian fish symbol. Um, the sun struck the fish. Oops, I should go back up. Sorry, sweet. Oh, 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 just a sec, just a sec. There we go. 
The sun struck the fish, reflected back on him, and he was dazed by it. So he was sort of transfixed by the light coming from the necklace. Uh, and he asks her about it. Um, he forgot about his pain. He was hypnotized by the gleam. Uh, he kept staring at the fish sign. What does it mean? She said, it's a sign worn by the early Christians. And then she gave him his meds. Uh, as he heard her words, he suddenly experienced anamnesis, a word that literally means loss of forgetfulness. I remembered who I was, where I was, and it was, well, back in ancient Rome. So he suddenly found himself living back in ancient Rome avoiding the Romans because they were secret Christians who had to hide from persecution. <clears throat> he saw the world as it was in apostolic Christian times when the fish sign was still in use. So it was used as kind of a, you know, secret sign. Hey, I'm one of you. Only lasted a few seconds. Uh, he went in and took his pain medication. He was bleeding really badly from his teeth. <clears throat> then a month later, it all began to seep through. There wasn't any way he could hold it back. He had a transformation and it stayed for years. He saw the world under the aspect of the Christian apocalypse. Um, to make a long story kind of short, uh, he wound up feeling as though he had company <laughs> in his head. There was someone else there with him and it was a clarifying experience. Um, he said that it was like uh, Plato's archetypical realm where everything was always eternal. So this goes back to what we were talking about earlier. Um, he says he was able to function perfectly in his everyday affairs. In fact, even better than normal, he was able to be dynamically social. This intelligence in his mind had a vast store of even technical knowledge. It had thousands of years of memory. It spoke Greek, Hebrew, Sanskrit. There wasn't anything it didn't seem to know. He managed to get publishers to pay him money that was owed to him so he started getting money and everything things were really looking up <laughs> one night he was listening to the beatles and he started to have the words transform hey, sweetie come here it's okay love come here it's okay it's okay mama's coming right back okay love. it's okay Okay, mama's coming back. Um, so this is where he gets uh, the message through the music that his son is in danger. So this is the one thing that, uh, you know, his wife couldn't explain it or anything. Um, he seems to have had a sort of premonition that his son had this condition that, was, that could kill him at any moment. Um, so... You can see that the words from what was Strawberry Fields here getting transformed uh, into your eyes are closed to your son's birth defect. Your son is in danger. He has a right inguinal hernia that's popped the hydro seal. And his son is saying, Eloi, Eloi, Lama Sabachthani. <laughs> Presumably Sanskrit or Hebrew. I think that's Hebrew, Eloi, I've heard before. Um, so he leaps up, goes to his wife and says, we have to go to the doctor now. And they go to the doctor and it turns out he was right. His son had this, uh, a right hernia, went into the scrotal sac. The surgeon says, we have to do surgery immediately. And your son could have died at any moment. Um, but that's just one thing that happened. That's actually where we're going to stop it. This goes on for quite a while, but uh, he winds up eventually... Uh, believing that he's sort of possessed by Elijah. He must have been insufferable to live around at this point. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Apparently, that's not true. He was very dynamic and intelligent. Um, but he was paranoid. He was thinking that police were like Roman soldiers and we need to be really careful around them. And he developed a code system with his wife where he said, if I touch my button on my shirt, that means look out, there's a Roman nearby <laughs> and stop talking about Christianity. So yeah, you can see him shunning the police. Uh, when he had the spirit of Elijah in him, he couldn't drive very well because he couldn't figure out the steering wheel and the pedals um, as someone from back then wouldn't be able to. Anyway, fascinating oh, stuff. Schizophrenic. Also what? 
It all sounds very schizophrenic. It does. It does. But, you know, there's that thin line between mystical knowledge and mental illness. <laughs> well, and then there's that one inexplicable thing about his son. But when yeah. I was younger and I was hanging out more with the magical thinking people, mm -hmm. it did seem like if you're sensitive to it and you're into it, mm -hmm. It does seem like there's like a whole lot more coincidences and certainly some of them to this day I can't explain and a lot sure. of us believe that if you were just more sensitive if you're just more open to it, you would know a lot of stuff but then oh, some of them did seem like they were slightly mentally ill you know it's oh it's definitely a mixed bag I have had some experience with such folks uh, for sure, <laughs> and it is that you for sure get some people who are in a bad place perhaps uh and because you know sometimes a synchronicity can have profound meaning but it can also suddenly convey intense dread and paranoia as to what's going to happen and in those cases i would venture to say that it's something more like mental illness that's happening to the person um, because they can see something and extrapolate a terrible sequence of events from that thing um and it's not good <laughs> uh but apparently this kind of worked out for phil he just had to digest it for years um and figure out what it really meant what it amounted to ultimately uh and uh sadly he passed away early um so who knows how far it would have gone yeah he had some horrific visions of you know being literally garroted and beheaded by roman soldiers but even kind of not caring when they come into the cell to do so to him. He's like cursing them out. Uh, yes, Vasily? No, I think he was under the pressure because he was, uh, since he was like imagining himself uh, and that he was in Roman times uh, a, a Christian, uh, that means he cared uh, like. Uh, I uh, was this year uh, studying about schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. Schiz I don't know how it, how it is spelled, but uh, about that illness. And I think it is, he was old uh, in that time. Like uh, he had 30 or 40 years, but schizophrenic, it is in, uh, I think it is uh, the latest moment, like 18 years, something like that. But I think he was under the pressure uh, because uh, he was he cared for uh, well he was in, uh, he had empathy I think and uh, he was under the pressure so he thought about he simply watched the uh, uh, that humans um, uh, simply had mistakes and so he wanted to. Uh, um in everyday life we all see bad things so yeah that's what he was uh, uh what he cared for uh, for humans and uh that's why he, and not for humans but uh, what is good generally and what's good for humans and then uh in that sense so i think it is that yeah yeah, he did convert to some kind of disorganized religion, <laughs> um, a kind of Gnostic Christianity, I think you would call it. Uh, not to get too much into Gnostic Christianity right now, that's a whole other can of worms. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, definitely a fascinating figure, definitely one that has influenced our culture quite a bit. And I'm sure that there will be more productions. In fact, I think if you look on an IDM, IDM, sorry, IMDB page for him, you'll see some stuff that's in production right now. Um, maybe somebody will get around to making uh, Ubik finally. Uh, hopefully they won't screw it up. I used to, <laughs> there's this thing where, you know, stuff gets made into a film or a series and uh people would say oh it's terrible if it's terrible then don't watch it and i would and people would say don't you know don't yuck my yum uh and i kind of was sympathetic to that idea for a while and then i saw a few really bad productions of things that i loved so much and i was like okay i'm gonna yuck some yums because when you see this that means you're not gonna read it and you're never gonna have a good impression of it because you saw this terrible thing 
Я с вас или? Well, also he was under drugs, so it's right. Also... I think all of those rationalizations are just easy ways out of something that's much more interesting and juicy <laughs> than than that. It's like you know, yeah, he was influenced by all kinds of things, uh, not just the sodium pentothal and methamphetamines. He also was a sickly person. There's more to his story that we didn't even have a chance to get into. Did you know that he uh, he is a surviving twin and his baby sister who lived less than a year, uh, he believed was a part of his life. She appears in some of his work. So he's a kind of haunted person from the beginning. You know, um, there's a lot going on there. And I don't I don't like the oh, he was on drugs thing. Sure, that's true. That's a way of people getting out of like putting anything into it. It was real for him and it affected his writing and his writing affected the world in some sense. Yes, Vasily. And, um, well, about uh, time machine, this motive, uh, I watched in one film. Uh, I don't know watch many science fiction. I didn't watch many science fiction movies, but in one film, uh, uh, like one character, he wanted to go back in uh, earlier in time because uh, he loved his dad, and he couldn't uh, as old uh, because he as a kid didn't have much contact. So it's maybe why uh, it is uh, this motive uh, in uh, this book. Given. Are you saying that was a Philip K. Dick story? No, I don't know. I don't uh -huh. know, but uh, simply it is maybe also some uh, uh, since he was thinking of much about the past, uh, it is some uh, nostalgia. No, nostalgia. See, I, I, I don't know if that's... I don't, from what I've read of the exegesis, I wouldn't say that he's a guy who was thinking about the past. It was more like uh, the present was unraveling. <laughs> and he was kind of a passenger almost in that, you know, like, <laughs> not like he was going, hmm, Roman times or anything like it wasn't uh -huh. something he actively pursued. It's like he found himself dumped into, you know, Bronze Age, Middle Eastern <laughs> like atmosphere all of a sudden. Um, so not quite the same thing as saying he thought of, thought about the past a lot. Um, so, yeah, it's it's not something to totally be unraveled, perhaps. It is what it is, although I hate when people say that. <laughs> um, all right, so we're going to stop it here. Um, yeah, feel free to, you know, if you come up with any other things, you can you can uh, email me and I'll, I'll email the group if you find some other stuff about, for example, 1939. I'm going to look into that a bit more too. Um, or anything else. And uh, we will... Uh, probably do the next reading group uh in the winter we want to let the kids get back to school and kind of settled in so i will definitely invite everybody thank uh you. and That's good. thank you for running these they're very interesting thank you it's been really great i'm so glad that you guys joined us uh I like that we got a nice like diverse group of people it's really great that you guys are visiting all the way from California. That's very cool. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That, was, that was really a pleasure to have uh, the opportunity to speak with native speakers, you know, and to, I don't, I mean, I don't say that you are not a native speaker, but you are now <laughs> Serbian, so we don't count you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's all right. That's good. I'm in the tribe now. Yeah, you are. <laughs> all right, guys. Until next time, take care. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.